equalize means this. It means everything that Jesus did and said, that's the gospel found in the four gospels. It's called good news. And gospelized thinking allows the central truths of the gospel to address the harsh events of life. You stand all the suffering and weakness and groaning in front of the gospel story of Jesus. And then you let this gospel story of Jesus address and speak to the suffering. That's what Paul does here. He stands his personal experience of suffering, groaning and weakness in front of the gospel story and he asks four formidable questions. Here's question one in verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? So who is this God who is for us? Well, first of all, he's the God who made you. Uh, The BBC program, Who Do You Think You Are? It's running a new series and millions of people will watch it. And we will watch and have watched with interest when a Josh Widdicombe or a Dame Judi Dench discover something which has been hidden in their ancestry. But the Bible asks the question, who do you think you are? And if you're willing to do the research, you'll discover the Bible says you are uniquely created in God's image. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, we're not products from a human assembly line where everyone looks and sounds the same. You are made in God's image and you are a unique you. There are many Davids in this church. Some say too many, but I'm, I'm a unique David. I'm David Coffey. And when I went for my COVID booster last week at the Eric Center, I arrived at the place at the desk where you have your jab, only to hear one nurse say to the other nurse, I'm dying for a coffee. So I said, well, here I am. (laughs) I am David Coffey, unique, and so are you. God created you uniquely. And he knows you personally. There's a wonderful passage of poetic brilliance in Psalm 139. It's in the middle of the Old Testament, the book of Psalms. It describes how well God knows you. The opening lines in the message version say this, God, investigate my life. Get all the facts firsthand. I'm an open book to you. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave and when I get back. I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say before I start the first sentence. I look behind me and you're there. And then up ahead and you're there too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. This is too much, too wonderful. I can't take it all in. So the God who made you is for you. And if the God who made you is for you, who can be against you? The God who made you understands you and he's promised that he will never abandon the work of his hands, what he's made. Now believing that doesn't answer all the questions about suffering. But you must trust that the God who made you and knows you is for you. And above all, he loves you, which is why he sent Jesus to earth. The importance of Jesus is it demonstrates to the full how much God loves you. That's why it says in our reading, verse 32, God didn't hesitate to spare his own son, Jesus. He exposed him to the worst suffering on the cross. So in Jesus, God has given us absolutely everything. He didn't hold back, and that's the pledge of his love. This is the God who is working in all things for our good. So if this God is on our side and is for you, how can we ever be losers? 
Here are two more formidable questions about God's love. They're in verses 33 and 34. Who will bring any charge against God's elect, those he's chosen? Or who is the one who condemns a believer? In a modern version, it reads like this. Who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of his chosen ones? Or who would even dare to point a finger at those he's chosen? You see, I think Paul here is thinking of those moments when we suffer inwardly. If you're a believer here this morning, you know how you suffer when you do bad things after becoming a Christian. In fact, in many ways, the suffering's worse. Because you know the person that you've disappointed and let down. When you do something so terrible, you begin to doubt if God could still love you, love you. And that's when Satan piles in to condemn and accuse us and say to us, and you are meant to be a Christian. I think Paul is imagining a, a courtroom scene where Satan has attempted to put believers, baptized believers, on trial with charges full of condemnation. He's such an expert at provoking guilt and shame and even in the lives of the saintliest Christian. And it's a warning to anyone being baptized or has been baptized for the rest of your life. Be aware, Satan attempts to resurrect things from the past, things to make us blush with shame, He's a wily enemy who can charge, condemn, and accuse. How, can any, how could God possibly love someone as wretched as you? And what we need if it's a court scene, we need a defense counsel. And there is a defense counsel who steps in to say, who dares to tangle with one of God's chosen? Who dares to point a finger at this disciple? And the counsel for the defense is none other than Jesus, the Savior, who defeated Satan on the cross. And that victory was vindicated when Jesus rose from the dead. And the last words that Jesus spoke before he said farewell to his disciples and returned to heaven. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I like what Dale Brunner says. He says, this means that his final words on earth were this. Jesus is saying, I am the chief executive officer of the universe. And this God is for you. He's standing there to defend you. He shows Satan the nail marks in his blood-stained hands and says, Satan, you have no power to condemn this saint. This saint belongs to me. And there's a fourth formidable question. Remember, we're doing gospelized thinking. We're bringing the events of the gospel and we're standing them against our suffering, weakness, and groaning. So here's the fourth question to stand in front of the suffering. Is there anything that can separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 35. And Paul then mentions some of the things that might separate us from the love of Christ. Our experience of trouble, hardship, persecution. And he lists many other things. But at the end of this magnificent chapter, he says this, I am convinced, absolutely confident, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. How can somebody be so convinced? Well, first of all, I think from his own experiences. Paul lists some of his personal sufferings in a book you can read in the New Testament. It's a book called 2 Corinthians in chapter 11. And it's in that chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians that he actually has his list of sufferings. He's not looking for sympathy. What he's wanting to argue, both here in Romans 8 and in that list, he wants to say, nothing that life throws at you will ever separate you from the love of God. Look at the list. He was beaten, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked. Eight times he said, my life was in danger. 
Danger in the city, danger in the country, danger at sea. There were people who wanted to kill him. There were storms that th- at sea that threatened to drown him. He described his preaching in a city called Ephesus, where lots of people turned out to oppose him, some of them demon-possessed. He said it was like fighting with wild beasts. But in none of these situations did he feel separated from God's love. In a moment, you're going to hear Rob's testimony. It's always good to hear somebody's testimony. They're an eyewitness. Rob's an eyewitness of what God has done in his life. Paul is our eyewitness to say, everything that life threw at me, it didn't separate me from the love of God. Our hold on God sometimes, we say, is never strong enough. Some of you are hanging on by your fingernails. And why he raises Jesus before us is to say the more important question than how strong is my love for God is how strong is his love for you? Is it dependable? In a few weeks we will celebrate Christmas. We'll remember the coming of Jesus to earth, God's best gift to us. Remember how Mary and Joseph are told by the angelic messenger uh, they didn't have any long debate as to what the baby's name was going to be. The baby's name was going to be Jesus. It means saviour. He was going to save people from their sin. So this baby, 33 years after he was born, would die. He would die on a cross. And this was God's plan and purpose for his son. And here's the point. Pause here. If you're saying this morning... I don't really feel I've got enough faith in me to just reach out and, and believe that, God, I love you, God, I love you. By focusing on Jesus, the whole thing is turned around. If you're saying, my love is pretty weak, how's his love for me? Well, when you focus on Jesus, you just realize how strong it is. You think of all the occasions when Jesus knew he was born to die. His very name means saviour from sin. I'm heading for the cross. Think of all the occasions when he could have walked away. Saying, my love isn't that strong. Forty days in the wilderness with Satan. He could have given in to Satan and said, okay, you win. All those religious leaders who held the power. He might have tried to compromise with them and say, look, I wonder if I should just go back to those quiet waters by the Sea of Galilee. What about when he walked into Gethsemane? Gethsemane was the garden he spent the night before he died. And he prayed. He was praying so hard, the sweat became like blood drops. And he said to the Lord, let this cup pass from me. What happens if he says, I don't think my love is strong enough? And he walks out of the garden saying, I can't drink this cup. Or what about when he's standing before Pilate and he says, actually, I'm not really a king. Could you just let me go? He was betrayed by one of his disciples. He was denied by another and he was deserted by the majority. And finally, on the cross, in the midnight darkness of the cross, he feels forsaken by God. I love the old preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon, where he says, in that moment, Jesus could have called for 10,000 angels to come and rescue him. But he stayed there. He stayed there. He stayed there to prove and pledge his love for you. So when Paul focuses On the love of Christ, is there anything that can separate us? Finally, in spite of whatever weak faith he has, he looks at the love of God and says, well, my love for the Lord may not be that strong, but this is how strong his love is for me. That's why God's word says, there's nothing, absolutely nothing, that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So will you come with your suffering and your doubts and stand them in front of these four formidable questions on God's love? If God is for us, 
Who can be against us? Who is there to condemn? Who can bring any charges against those whom God has chosen? Is there anything that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? Friends, with all the mysteries of life, and there's lots of mystery here this morning, there are some things in life we don't know. And there are some things in life we will never know. But there is one thing in life we do know. Romans 8, 28 says, We know, we know that in all things, God is working for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. It's, it's the greatest thing in life, as Rob is discovering, to be in the company of those who've been called by God to be able to say, I didn't choose him, he chose me. And it's this God that is for you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for everyone here who has taken that step of committing their life to you. Disciples who are full of joy but also know what it is to pass through fire and storm, suffering with great pain, but knowing that in the midst of that suffering, they were never drowned, and the flames never burnt them. And I pray for those who perhaps are on the outside looking in. I pray that uh, the witness of your word, the testimony of your servant Rob, that these will have a powerful persuasive effect in the lives of many this morning and we ask this in Jesus name amen we're going to uh, sing the hymn in Christ alone and as Steve said if you've got children in Sunday school perhaps during the hymn you could go and uh, collect them bring them back for the baptism service thank you
please take your seats. So for those of you who haven't seen a baptism before, we have um, lots of symbols going on. The first symbol, is, of course, is water, uh, symbolizing that saving, forgiving power of Jesus that David has just been talking about. The other symbol is that it's shaped a bit like a grave. It's the idea that as Rob uh, will go uh, vertical from vertical to horizontal in a minute, um, it's representing that, that idea that his old life, all the things that he's ashamed of, the things that he feels guilt about will die. They'll be left behind and he'll be risen up uh, to a new life. Um, of course, Rob will continue to make mistakes. He'll continue to face all the things that we all face. But he's now making this public declaration that he's choosing uh, to follow Jesus. Now, one of the things that we always encourage someone to do, and I'll be asking Rob this promise in, in a minute, is that as a disciple of Jesus, will he go into the world and uh, make uh, new disciples? And so anyone who's being baptized, I always say to them, who is the person in your life who has been most involved in making you a disciple, to, bringing you to Jesus? And, and he said, Kirsten, his wife. So um, Kirsten will be in the water uh, with us as we baptize uh, Rob this morning. So um, now we're going to go on to the really the best bit, the bit that I enjoy the most, which is to hear the person's story. So uh, let's listen together and let's hear uh, Rob's testimony. So Rob, tell us uh, how you met Jesus, why you decided to get baptized today. Well, um, all through my life I, I hadn't met Jesus. I wasn't, uh, God wasn't part of my life um, until about three and a half years ago when I met a lady who subsequently became my wife, uh, many of you will know Kirsten, and she was a regular churchgoer at, at Upton Vale and she was a devout Christian and after a while I thought I must go and see what, what this is all about. So in November 2018 I walked into Upton Vale for the first time and I was just immediately overwhelmed by the numbers of people in the church and the, the welcoming, friendly, uh, the welcome that I got there. And I, I immediately felt part of, of God's family and that was the start of my journey. Um, I then went on to do two Alpha courses and then I was greatly honoured to be asked to join a microgroup with uh, David Coffey, Tony Hines and Trevor Bartlett. And together with Kirsten, they have been my guides on my journey. Uh, I was always looking for a light bulb moment, so uh, my, my sort of Paul on the road to Damascus moment, if you like. <laughs> um, and that actually came on the road to Paynton one day. I was driving along and I suddenly thought, I must ask God for forgiveness for my sins and that was the moment that I thought I, the only way I can do that is to make my commitment and I was still slightly doubtful because I thought I needed to know all the answers before I made my commitment but then talking to people in church I, I realised that nobody has all the answers so I thought why don't I make my commitment and ask God to come on my journey with me so that's what I'm I'm doing today and I'm looking forward to carrying on my journey with God in my life, strengthening my faith, strengthening my belief in Him and well, that's why I'm here today. Amen. Oh, yeah, it's great, isn't it, to hear Rob's story. So you heard uh, David in his sermon um, mention the micro group, and Rob mentioned it in his uh, in his uh, testimony as well. So um, two of the other members from the micro group, Trevor and Tony, are going to share a few words uh, with you now, as well some words from Scripture with us. Hi. First of all, Rob, it's a great privilege to be at your long-awaited baptism, and uh, Tony and I have got a couple of verses for you. Uh, First of all, I hope you haven't got your light bulb in there with you. <laughs> so Tony's got a, a, a passage that I believe was also at Kirsten's baptism uh, when David Coffey baptized you many years ago. Yes, it's uh, Proverbs 3, uh, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart 
and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. And I've got a, a passage, uh, just one verse from Proverbs. What I really love about the, the phone app is you can swipe through various translations and this is the one I found best for this occasion. So it's Proverbs 16 verse 9. Better a little, no it's not, it's verse 9. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Bless you. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Yeah, very good. Good thematic verses there about God directing your path and trusting him along the way, just as you have been doing up until this point, Rob. So I'm going to ask you these questions that we've talked about uh, leading up to today. And the first question I want to ask in front of all these people here watching this morning, Rob, do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I do. Jesus is Lord. Great. And do you turn from your sin, renounce evil, and intend to follow Christ? I do. Christ is my way. Fantastic. And will you live within the fellowship of the church, and will you serve Jesus Christ in the world? With the Spirit's help, I will. Great. now baptize you in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. service and um, we just want to say if there's anybody whose heart has been stirring us through the morning service if there's anybody who's thinking that maybe baptism is for you that maybe this is something that God is asking you to do um, as a step of faith and as, as as part of your testimony then do speak to somebody speak to Steve um, if there's nobody that you want to speak to today then please do email in to our community email address and we'd love to get somebody in touch with you so do just have that in your mind and be praying about that, that if that's a step for you at this time, then we'd love to explore that with you. Our final song, though, this morning is The Lion and the Lamb, which might sound like strange language, but the lamb is it's representative of Jesus who came as a sacrifice, who gave his life for all of us, each and every one of us. And the lion is, the, is that victorious animal in the jungle, and God is that, is that victor, victorious um, being over this whole earth. He, he is victorious over death. And so we sing that. And then the song goes on to say, who can stop the Lord Almighty? He's on our side. 
So let's just sing this with celebration, with joy in our hearts as we finish this service this morning. Please do stand if you're able. God, we believe in you as God the Father. We believe that you sent Jesus, Jesus your Son, to die for each and every one of us. And we believe that you raised him to life again so that we didn't have to pay the price. And we believe in your Holy Spirit and we believe that if we ask that you will live inside us through your Spirit. And Lord, because we believe all those things, we also believe that nothing can stand against us because you are for us. And we praise you and we thank you that you want that intimate relationship with each of us. So we go from this place in confidence that you are with us and that you will walk through us in every circumstance. And we praise you and we thank you for that, Lord. Amen. I'd just like to read um, a blessing over you as we finish our service. It's for each and every one of you here. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon each of you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and I pray he gives you his peace. I pray that you have a really good week. Thank you for joining us this morning and uh, we'll see you next week.
Thrown into 